that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep suddenly an angel of the lord appeared among them and the radiance of the lord's glory surrounded them they were terrified but the angel reassured them don't be afraid he said i'll bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people the savior yes the messiah the lord has been born today in bethlehem the city of david and you will recognize him by this, this sign you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in the manger suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others the armies of heaven praising god and saying glory to god in the highest heaven and peace on earth those who with whom god is pleased when the angels had returned to heaven the shepherds said to each other let's go to bethlehem let's see this thing that has happened which the lord has told us about they hurried to the village and found mary and joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger after seeing him the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child all who heard the shepherd story was were astonished but mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often the shepherds went back to their flocks glorifying and praising god for all they had heard and seen it was just as the angel had told them here in the reading praise be to god we just heard from the gospel of luke chapter 2 two more scriptures i want to bring first which will show us the first point god promised everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son he created the universe the son radiates god's own glory and expresses the very character of god and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command all things were created through Jesus Christ the son of god all things are sustained carried by Jesus Christ the son of god and all things in the universe belong to him as an inheritance it will all be his and another verse like this in colossians says christ is the visible image of the invisible god He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Again we see all things created through Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ and all things belong to Jesus Christ. So we can say Jesus is rich. What is there in the universe that is not his? All things belong to him. I worked one summer on this uh, on Mercer Island in this in Seattle area and it's known as being a very rich place with huge houses. But right across the uh, the lake lives Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, and his house is even bigger than all those on Mercer Island. And we would all kind of play this game my partner and I doing this uh, park maintenance my job for the summer. We would try to figure out if Bill Gates had enough money to buy the entire island with all these multi-million dollar houses because Bill Gates at that time had something like 80 billion dollars. that is rich but what is that compared to Jesus Christ who owns all things everywhere he's the co-creator of the universe the father with the son created the universe he sustains everything he keeps it running by his power and he is the heir of everything the one who inherit all things so jesus is rich that's our first point now we read about the uh just uh, the after the birth of jesus the angels announced to the shepherds the shepherds go and find jesus and he is lying in a manger which is a a feeding trough for animals not the place you expect a king to be born and just after this it goes on to say that uh uh mary 
and Joseph took Jesus to the temple and they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons and if you look back in the law of the Lord that describes the offering that is to be made when a child is born it actually says when the time of purification is completed for either a son or a daughter the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a purification offering and then it goes on and says if a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons so it should be a lamb and a bird and if the woman can't afford the lamb because she is poor then she should bring two birds instead and when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple they brought two birds not a lamb because they could not afford the lamb they were a poor family so Jesus was rich and yet Jesus was poor he was born to a poor family in poor circumstances not born in a home born on the move born and placed in a manger these are situations of poverty and he was visited first by the poor and the despised in the society shepherds were seen by everybody as the lowest of the low you know Psalm 23 says the Lord is my shepherd and for us it speaks of this comfort God's protection and his care for us and the Jewish rabbis over you know over the centuries since the time that psalm was written their perception the way they thought of shepherds changed and the Jewish rabbis knew that shepherds are the lowest of the low nobody cares about them and they struggled to explain why Psalm 23 says the Lord is my shepherd why would anybody ever call God a shepherd so this is how they were seen in the time when Jesus was born and who are the first people to come and visit Jesus when he is born nobody where nobody wealthy nobody well off nobody famous it's a group of shepherds the poor and despised of the society who come to visit Jesus so Jesus was rich and he is rich now but Jesus was poor the time he was born Jesus became poor in nature he is God he's the co-creator the sustainer the heir of all things but he was born as a human baby to poor parents now could he go any lower to be born in this uh, where he was born and laid in a manger and visited by shepherds could it go any lower than that being having all riches but becoming so poor well yes he could go lower it says in Philippians chapter 2 though he was God he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to something to hold on to instead he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being and that's not the lowest that's what we read about this is what uh, uh, we read so far him being born but when he appeared in human form he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross in his birth he was poor in his death he was even poorer having nothing being shamed being humiliated suffering from all riches to complete poverty why did Jesus become poor from riches to poverty why he could have come in glory in power and with riches he could have come that way right all things belong to him he could have come in a different way but he came in humility and in suffering and in poverty 
Why? Another verse, 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is writing, he says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, so that by His poverty He could make you rich. He was rich, He became poor for your sake, to make you rich. He lowered Himself to our status so that He could raise us to His status. He became like we are so that we can become like He is. Not being gods, but being restored in the image of God, which is how we were created in the beginning. He became like us so that we can become like him. Another verse similar says, He became sin who had no sin, who knew no sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus be took all sin upon himself, even though he had none in his own being. Why? So that we could become God's righteousness. This is the whole story of the gospel. He became like we are, fully human, poor even, so that He could make us like Him. That's what our faith is about. Jesus became poor to make us rich. Think for a moment, how has Christ enriched your life? Not how has He made you wealthy, but how has He enriched your life in every way? What mercy have you experienced? What grace has God given you? What goodness do you have in your life? How have things changed? Think of the richness you have in relationships. Think of the richness you have in God's love. The things that are worth far more than any amount of money. This is why Jesus, though He was rich, He became poor. To make you rich. To share the love, the power, the grace of God. So this is what Christmas is about. This passage we read in Luke is known to be a Christmas passage because it's about the birth of Jesus Christ. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, the Son of God, who became poor to make us rich. This is known as the Incarnation. God becoming human, or literally becoming flesh. That the Son of God became a human being still was God and yet became a human being like us. This is an amazing thing. The identity of Jesus Christ then is both God and human. He was God in nature, but He was born as a human being. There are, there are people in the world who want mystery. They want they want in life, they want in faith, they want in their belief something that's big. And sometimes people go searching in all sorts of weird places for experiences or beliefs that seem a little out there. But this belief, this truth about Jesus Christ is the greatest mystery. That God Himself became a human being. And no matter how much you think about it, no matter how much you sing about it, how much you pray about this fact that God became a human being, it does not get old. It does not stop being a mystery. This week I had a short conversation with somebody about quantum physics. And I don't claim to know really anything about quantum physics, except that it is really weird. They say things like, Light is both a particle and a wave at the same time. We can't really explain how or why, just that it is that way. 
And they say things like the tiniest uh, electrons or the tiniest parts of the, the, the physical stuff in the world, you can either measure its location or you can measure its speed. I think that's what they say. But you can't measure both of them because if you measure one, it changes the other. I don't claim to understand that. All I'm saying is that it's weird and it is a mystery. And it probably doesn't matter how much you study it, it remains a mystery. That this is how the world works. That is strange. And no matter how much you think about Jesus being God but becoming a man, it remains a mystery. And what I mean is that it is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And when we see things in the world like quantum physics and so on, and when we see things like God becoming a human being, we should put our mind to work and do our best to understand it. But we should also bow our knees and say, God, you are beyond what I can comprehend. I worship you and I praise you. That when God's Son was born, He was born in a manger. He was visited by the poor, the shepherds. Yet He was rich and all things in the universe belonged to Him. Then we get on our knees and we say, Jesus, we receive you. We worship you. And this is what Christmas is about. However, isn't Christmas about trees and presents and lights and decorations? There's all these things we do as a celebration of Christmas. And I, there are actually different ways people celebrate Christmas around the world. And uh, I want to just take you through those briefly. In Sweden, they have a tradition of uh, the family gets together and they all eat this rice pudding. And one person finds an almond hidden in the rice pudding. And then they get some kind of prize or treat. Yeah? In uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, the southern part of Mexico, they have the Noche de los Rabanos, the night of radishes. And they carve radishes into all sorts of figures. And it happens right around the time of Christmas. Why? I have no idea. But that's how they celebrate Christmas in Oaxaca. In South Africa, can somebody confirm if this is true, that on Christmas Day they eat fried caterpillars? No? Our South Africans say no. I found it online. Huh? Maybe they're just denying it and they don't want to own up, huh? Some people say that some people in South Africa eat fried caterpillars on Christmas because, hey, Jesus was born. Why not eat fried caterpillars? In Greenland, a traditional dish around Christmas time is called kiviak, and it's a seal skin stuffed with whole birds and left to ferment. Yeah? It sounds like Zura Haring. <laughs> In the United States, there is a traditional drink around Christmas time that is almost as bad as fermented birds stuffed in a seal skin, and it's called eggnog. I advise you to avoid it at all costs. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> James and I can discuss later. There are things people do around Christmas time that are really strange. And if you are new to the country of Belgium, or new to the United States, or you are new to Christianity, and you hear people talk about Christmas, and then they say, let me pour you a glass of eggnog, we always drink this around Christmas. Let me give you fried caterpillars, we always have this on Christmas. Or, they show you this person, Sinterklaas, and his Zwarte Piets. <laughs> And then they also say, there's this person named Santa Claus. I can imagine somebody who is new to the country or new to Christianity would say, what is this about? This is Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, so, so who is Santa Claus about? What's all the food? What's all the trees and the lights and all these things? What's it about? And you say, well, Christmas is celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ was born. And people are, that's done, doesn't make it any clearer, does it? 
We're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ by putting up trees with lights, and there's this guy named Santa Claus, there's another guy named Santa Claus, and here I have a glass of eggnog. Where does this all come from? There's actually another man named St. Nicholas. And he was a bishop in the church in uh, what is now Turkey. And you can still see that Sinterklaas, whose name comes from St. Nicholas and Santa Claus also, they look slightly like him. Being a bishop, he had special clothes, the red robe with the white. He wore the bishop's hat. Huh? And St. Nicholas was a man who was uh, known for defending and explaining our understanding of Christ's humanity and his divinity. There were people at his time who said there was a time when Jesus the Son did not exist and God created him first before anything else. And other people said, no, that is not correct. If we say Jesus was created, then he's no longer God. And in that case, he's no longer Savior. And in that case, his birth was no longer the incarnation of the Son of God. And they uh, held a council in a place called Nicaea. And they created the Nicene Creed, which we read earlier, saying Jesus is true God from true God, light from light, begotten from the Father before all ages, saying He is eternal, and yet He became incarnate through Mary. And this man, St. Nicholas, was known as one who stood firm for that truth when it was being attacked. He was also known for somebody, being somebody who helped the poor. There is not really so much known about Nicholas, but some of the stories that have been passed down are that he, uh, he once took bags of gold or pieces of gold and put them into so in socks that were hanging out to dry in a family that was so poor that the daughters of this family had no option but to become prostitutes to support themselves. And Nicholas put gold in their socks that were hanging out to dry, or he put it down the chimney and it fell into the socks. We don't really know, but the idea is that he helped the poor. So here's a man who knew Jesus Christ and who helped the poor. So when we celebrate Christmas, we can follow the example of St. Nicholas. Seek Christ. Know Christ worship Christ and help the poor. These are the things we receive from our fathers and mothers in the faith. I want to say a few ways you can help the poor. Jesus was rich, he became poor. When that passage we read from 2 Corinthians said, to, he became poor to make us rich. The whole context, context of that passage is saying, so we also should follow his example and be generous and help those who are poor. Here are three organizations that help the poor. These are some of my favorites. Maybe you have other ideas. You can also give to somebody directly who you know has a need. The Voice of the Martyrs helps Christians around the world who are being persecuted, who are in prison, or whose families are in prison, and provides aid to them, help to them. International Justice Mission helps people who are being taken advantage of, people who are being sold, bought and sold as slaves, which still happens today. It helps people who, uh, when the husband dies, then people sometimes come and grab their land, and they can do it because the woman has no backing, no support, and they bring lawyers in to defend this woman's right to have her property after her husband dies. Things like that, you can give to support that mission. Partners International, which is another, my favorites, my brother actually worked for them for a while. They support churches and ministries around the world who are doing, uh, preaching the gospel and helping people with practical needs. So through Partners International, you can buy goats and they're given through a church to a family. And when their first baby goats are born, they return them to the church and they're given to another family. Things like that. Or you can buy, if you have a little more than two goats, you can buy a pair of oxen or cattle that will help in plowing the ground. You can pay something like a hundred euros 
more or less, and you can supply water for a whole village. A hundred euros supplies water for people. This is amazing, and we have the ability to do this. Or you can buy Bibles for people who do not have them otherwise. There are many other ways, many other organizations, but I want you to consider not only the giving of gifts to one another, but the giving of gifts to people who are truly in need. This is a part of our celebration of Christmas, is to follow the example of Jesus Christ. To seek and know and worship Jesus Christ also, you have ideas, you know what this means, to read and to study and to meditate on God's Word, to pray, to fast, to give, to sing, and to celebrate. This is good news. When the angels announced to the shepherds, they said, we have good news. The Savior, the Lord, the Messiah has been born. And we have good news. The Savior, the Lord, the Messiah has been born. He was rich, but for our sakes, He became poor. And if you want to celebrate by putting up a tree with lights on it, do it. If you want to celebrate by giving gifts and receiving gifts, do it. If you want to celebrate by eating fried caterpillars, or whole fermented birds stuffed in a, stuffed in a seal skin, or drinking eggnog, then by all means do it. Huh? If you remember that this is about the birth of Jesus Christ and it should be a joyful celebration. So we, with the angels who made the announcement, with the shepherds who came to visit Jesus, with the wise men also who came to visit Jesus, the poor came to seek Him and also the rich, the powerful, the educated, the wise, they came to worship Him too. Whatever your background, whether you have a lot or a little, it can be used to worship Jesus Christ. And with Saint Nicholas, we come and worship Jesus. The Son of God, light from light, true God from true God, who became a human being for us. This is Christmas. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your great mercy and your kindness. We thank you for your plan of salvation that you had in mind from the time the earth was created, from the time you created the whole universe and all there is. Jesus was with you in the creation. The Father and the Son together from all eternity. And when the time came, Jesus was born as a human being, still being God but becoming human and giving up all the riches and glory to become poor as a human being, willing to suffer and willing to die. We praise and thank you, God, for this good news. We praise and thank you that Jesus became like us so that He can make us like you. And we pray for your help this Christmas season to remember Jesus Christ to worship and to know Jesus and to follow His example, inspire us and lead us to help those who are poor. We pray for that spirit of generosity that You have given to us, Your own Son. May we follow in His footsteps. In Jesus' name, Amen.